All right, so let's go ahead and switch gears a little bit. Uh, we finished discussing the process of how muscle contracts, which is again underpinned by the EC coupling mechanism. Let's now turn our focus onto some discussion on motor units and how motor units are involved in the ability for muscles to be able to produce different levels of force depending on the demand or needs. So first, let's recap what a motor unit is. Remember, a motor unit is a single alpha motor neuron and all the muscle fibers or cells it innervates or connects to via the neuromuscular junction. Now to take this a step further, a motor unit contains only one type of muscle fiber, each innervated by a single alpha motor neuron. And the type of muscle fiber contained within the motor unit determines the type of motor unit. Therefore, motor unit type is interchangeable with muscle fiber type since they both go hand in hand. We know at this point that there are generally three types of muscle fibers, although more recent research has identified other types. But to keep it simple, let's stick with the three known types of muscle fibers. We have the type 1, the type 2A, and type 2X. Oftentimes, you will see the 2X here described as 2B. In human muscle, this is incorrect. It is 2X. So with that said, a type 1 motor unit is a single alpha motor neuron innervating type 1 muscle fibers. A type 2A motor unit is a single alpha motor neuron innervating type 2A muscle fibers and so on. Now the characteristics that differentiate these muscle fiber types are also what differentiates these motor unit types. Let's talk about how these motor units and thus fibers differ from one another. Type 1 motor units, as you see here, we said it contained type 1 muscle fibers, which are also referred to as slow twitch muscle fibers. Now, what is a twitch? A twitch is a type of muscle contraction. A twitch contraction is a result of one single action potential or electrical impulse. One action potential results in a brief pulsatile contraction. So twitch speed is a measure of how fast the muscle fibers in a motor unit contract in response to a single action potential. This is essentially the speed of the entire EC coupling process as we discussed before, all the way down to the sliding filament process. Twitch speed can be used interchangeably with contraction or contractile speed, how fast the muscle can contract in other words. So a slow twitch speed is essentially a slow contractile speed. So type 1 motor units with its type 1 fibers have a comparatively slow contractile speed. Type 1 motor units also have a relatively low force generating capacity. They are the weakest of the three types. However, type 1 motor units, particularly the type 1 fibers, are fatigue resistant meaning they are able to produce repeated contractions and force, albeit low amounts of force, for generally a longer period of time. So type 1s are less fatigable. Now, as you can see in this table, as we go from type 1 to type 2A to type 2X motor units slash fibers, twitch or contractile speed gets faster, maximum force gets higher, and fatigability gets higher. So fatigue resistance gets lower, in other words. So type 1 and 2Xs are on the ends of a spectrum with type 2A somewhere in the middle. It's somewhat considered an intermediate fiber. So here are three important questions associated with motor unit types. Number one, do different muscles or muscle groups contain one single type of motor unit or a variety of motor units? Remember, every muscle is made up of multiple motor units, collectively called the motor unit or motor neuron pool. So within the motor unit pool of a given muscle, such as the rectus femoris, for example, is there only one type of motor unit or a variety of motor units within that pool? The general answer to this is that a given muscle contains a variety of motor unit types within its motor unit pool. 
So there is generally a mixture of type 1s, 2As, and 2Xs, although 2Xs are rare and not very abundant in most individuals. However, here is an important point. Depending on the muscle, the distribution of these motor unit types may differ. Some muscles have higher percentage of type 1s versus type 2s, while some other muscles are opposite. For example, the triceps brachii, which is the muscle on the backside or posterior part of the arm and that extends the elbow, is predominantly type 2s. This is the same for the rectus femoris, which is one of the quadriceps muscles. On the other hand, the soleus, which is one of the calf muscles, is known to be predominantly type 1. Now you must keep in mind, however, the distribution of motor unit types and therefore muscle fiber types varies quite a bit from one individual to another. So this leads me to the next question. What are the factors that determine fiber type distribution? In other words, what factors determine the percentage of type 1s to type 2s in any given individual? Now there are a couple answers to this. The primary answer and arguably the most influential to fiber type distribution is genotype, or in simpler terms, genetic makeup. We should know by now that we as biological organisms are limited by our individual genotype. Our genetic makeup determines our physiological and physical characteristics, including muscle fiber type distribution throughout our entire musculature. For most individuals, we have an overall fiber type and thus motor unit type distribution of 50% type 1 and 50% type 2s. Now the distribution of the type 2A and 2Xs is highly variable. Generally speaking, most of us in this class will be 50-50 type 1 to type 2s. Now for some individuals, there is a larger distribution of type 2s versus type 1s generally across the entire musculature. This is again majorly explained by genotype or genetic makeup. These are inherited traits in other words. So what type of population do we think is known to have a relatively greater distribution of type 2 muscle fibers? To explain this, I like to use track athletes. The reason being is that in track, there are athletes that represent each end of a performance capacity spectrum. On one end, you have the sprinters, and on the other end, you have your endurance athletes. So what we see in the elite sprint athletes through years of data in muscle physiology is a large percentage of type 2 fibers and within the type 2 fiber pool, a large percentage of type 2 X fibers. So let's do some critical thinking here. Why do you think the elite sprinter is an elite sprinter besides their training? Well, if your musculature was majorly made up of muscle fibers that have the fastest contractile speed and the highest maximum force output, don't you think that from a performance standpoint that you would have a greater capacity to be fast and to be strong? Well, of course. And again, this fiber type distribution is primarily determined by one's genotype. In sports like track, genotype is a huge factor. Your physiological characteristics like fiber type distribution plays a huge role on how much potential you have. This is often referred to as genetic potential. Genetic potential in sports, especially in track, is a huge factor in terms of how far an athlete can achieve in terms of level of competition. Can they make it to the elite level? Do genetics play a role in whether or not they achieve that goal? Yes, it does. If you look at the Olympic level sprinters and endurance athletes, you will see very distinct genotypes that suggest very distinct fiber type distribution in comparison to the general population. Now, on the other hand, you have your elite endurance athlete. What do you think their fiber type distribution looks like? The data shows a very heavy type 1 percentage across their musculature. And again, just like the sprinter, this fiber type distribution contributes heavily to their athletic capacities as an endurance athlete. And again, this fiber type distribution is largely determined by genetics. So yes, genetic potential is a very real thing. And yes, there are individuals that have a high type 1 or type 2 distribution, but never really realize that potential oftentimes because they don't have any interest in sports perhaps. 
There could be some of you in this class that may have the muscle genotype of an elite Olympic sprinter but just never realized it. Now this brings me to the final question. Can you change your fiber type distribution by training a certain way? For example, if you are 50-50 type 1 to type 2, can you shift that to be, for example, 60% uh, type 1 and 40% type 2s just by training a certain way? For example, by doing endurance training. Now, this has been a topic of debate for a long time, and I published a paper with some colleagues not too long ago about this topic. So if you're interested in reading it, please let me know. So the general understanding at this point amongst muscle physiologists is that yes, fiber type shifting can occur, but has a very small impact on the overall fiber type distribution across the entire musculature. For example, if any of you decided to start training like a sprinter, you may see some increase in type 2 fibers, which is theorized to have resulted from type 1 fibers shifting to a type 2. However, this is not very well substantiated. One reason being, it is difficult to test in research. So one type of shifting, however, that has been shown is the shifting between type 2 A's and X's as a result of specific training. More specifically, high-powered, high-velocity, or high-force type of training. On the other hand, if we started training like an endurance athlete, one may experience a slight increase in type 1 fibers, and it is also theorized that this is a result from a shift from type 2s, specifically the type 2A, the intermediary fiber. Again, this is not very well substantiated due to limitations in testing methodologies and research. But again, there is some evidence that shifting can occur. Now, you may ask, does this mean we can, quote unquote, override our genetics? No, that's not what this means. In my strong expert opinion, I don't believe you can completely flip or change your fiber type distribution, again, because it is largely determined by your genotype. What I believe is that your genotype limits the extent of shifting that is allowable in response to specific training. So in other words, your genotype determines how much shifting can occur, but there is no case where you can completely flip your fiber type distribution. So in simple terms, fiber type shifting may not be a huge factor in human performance. Otherwise, anyone can become an elite sprinter or endurance runner just by training. Yes, you can get better at sprinting, or yes, you can get better at being an endurance runner, but you cannot shift your fiber type distribution to an extent where you can simply become an elite endurance or sprint athlete through changes in fiber type distribution. This is not going to happen simply by training. So yes, the primary factor that determines fiber type distribution is genetics. It's genotype, your genetic makeup. Now this is why I say sometimes that the sport, especially in track, chooses the athlete and not the athlete choosing the sport. The genes that you are born with play a huge role on your potential to succeed to the elite level. Now in most team sports, you will see a very large variability among athletes in genotype and fiber type distribution, and fiber type distribution may not be a huge factor in these types of sports. So just because you don't have a special muscle genotype and fiber type distribution, it doesn't mean you can't succeed in sports. This is why I use track as an example, since this is one of the sports where muscle genotype and fiber type distribution would have a big impact because you have athletes on opposite ends or extreme ends of a performance spectrum. Again, like sprinters and ultra endurance runners. Okay, now that we understand the different types of motor units and their individual characteristics, and the fact that every muscle contains a pool of motor units with a variety of types, let's discuss some very important principles to understand how motor units function during your everyday movements, like when you exercise or take a walk or even just get out of your seat. The first principle that you must understand is the all or none principle. The all or none principle states that when a single motor neuron fires, all of its associated fibers contract maximally. So once the CNS decides to activate a given motor neuron and send down action potentials, all of the fibers that the activated motor neuron innervates will contract maximally as hard as possible. What this means is that the motor units 
cannot cause only some of the fibers of the unit to contract. So for example, if the motor unit contained 10 fibers, the motor neuron cannot activate and contract five out of the 10. When the neuron fires, all 10 will contract maximally, according to the all or none principle. Also, the motor unit cannot cause fibers within said motor unit to contract part way, meaning the neuron cannot contract the innervated fibers, for example, 50% of its capacity. It will be always 100%, again, based on the all or none principle. So again, just to recap, based on the all or none principle, when a motor neuron fires, meaning an action potential is generated and propagating, all the fibers it is connected to will contract as hard as possible with as much force as possible. So with that said, the question rises of how is it that you can produce different levels of force? We all know that depending on what you are contracting against, you need to produce different levels of force. For example, when you curl a 10 pound dumbbell to a 20 pound to a 30 pound dumbbell, your biceps need to produce increasing levels of force. When you're walking on a flat surface, but then hit an incline or a set of stairs, lower body muscles need to produce increasing levels of force. Even if I went from picking up a pencil to picking up a hammer, same muscles involved, but different levels of force needed. The ability for our muscles to produce different levels of force in response to a particular force demand or need, or in other words, resistance, is referred to as force gradation, producing different grades of muscular force. So if the all or none principle is true, how is it that we can produce different grades or levels of force? Force gradation is done through these two primary mechanisms, altering the recruitment of motor units, and firing rate of motor units. Now I'm going to skip to the next slide to help you better visualize these two mechanisms. So first, motor unit recruitment. As you can see in this example here on the left, we have one single motor unit, which is a motor neuron innervating three fibers. Let's just say this is a motor unit in your biceps. And let's, for example, say that during a 10 pound bicep curl, the force that is required to move the 10 pound weight as you curl can be satisfied by this one single motor unit. So this neuron fires and all the fibers here contract maximally and the overall force produced from these three fibers are sufficient to curl that 10 pound dumbbell. Now let's say you increase the weight to 15 pounds in the next set. Now the force demand has increased by five pounds roughly. In other words, there is more resistance. So how does your biceps produce more force to curl against this increased resistance? Does this single motor unit produce more force? No, according to the all or none principle, it can't produce more force because when they are activated, they contract maximally. So how does your biceps produce more force to curl against a greater resistance? Your neuromuscular system, specifically your central nervous system, your CNS for short, recruits more motor units within the motor unit pool of your biceps. For example, when the resistance goes up from 10 to 15 pounds, the CNS will recruit two more motor units to quote unquote help out. So you can see in this example, you have two more motor units, each innervating three fibers each. So now in total, three motor units are activated and nine fibers total are contracting maximally. So of course, when you have nine fibers maximally contracting versus three maximally contracting, your biceps are going to be producing more force, just enough to curl against the 15 pound weight. Now as you increase the resistance to say 20 pounds, your CNS can recruit even more motor units in the biceps motor unit pool, and thus more fibers are contracting maximally and contributing to greater force production. Now you can keep increasing the resistance until you get to your maximum where you cannot produce any more force during the curl. This is often referred to as your max strength or your maximum strength for that particular exercise of the bicep curl. This is the point generally where your CNS cannot recruit more motor units within the motor unit pool, and thus you cannot produce more force, and thus the weight cannot be curled. 
This is again what your neuromuscular system experiences when you are lifting your max or your one rep max for a given exercise. Now, how do you think we can get stronger and one day be able to lift more than our max? Obviously, we need to train. Later on in our third lecture series, we will talk about the science behind strength development in response to training, more specifically resistance training, and how increasing the capacity of how many motor units we are able to recruit influences our maximum strength. More on this later. Now here is a helpful analogy to help you better understand motor unit recruitment. Imagine you are trying to lift a table all by yourself and you're giving as much effort as you can, maximal effort if you will. The overall force exerted on the table is low because it is only you producing the force. Now what can you do to lift the table more efficiently? You can call over a couple of your friends. In other words, you recruit a couple of your friends to come and help lift the table. Now when three people are exerting maximum force on the table, there is now collectively more force exerted on the table and the table is lifted more efficiently. Now when there is an increase in force demand or resistance on a given muscle or muscle group, your CNS is simply recruiting more friends to help out. Now in addition to increased motor unit recruitment, you also have increased motor unit firing rate or frequency. Now we will discuss both recruitment and frequency in more detail in the next few slides, but as a general description, firing rate or frequency refers to the rate of action potentials generated at the CNS and propagating down the motor neuron and exciting the muscle fiber. Anytime we produce a joint action like a knee extension or elbow flexion, the muscles involved contract and produce as much force as is needed. These muscle contractions are a result of multiple action potentials propagating through the motor unit. Generally speaking, the faster the rate at which action potentials are produced, the greater the force that can be produced in a given motor unit. So let's take this one single motor unit here. Let's also take the bicep curl example again. For a 10 pound curl, this single motor unit required action potentials to be produced and propagated at a rate of 100 action potentials per second or 100 Hertz, which is the unit of measurement that represent action potentials per second. Now in the next set, you wanted to curl 20 pounds, so 10 pounds more. Now the force demand has increased because there's more resistance to contract against. So now in your biceps, you know there is more recruitment of motor units as we see here, but in addition to more recruitment, each of those motor units have an increased rate of action potential generation and propagation. Now in the 20 pound curl, the motor units that are active in the biceps receive action potentials at an increased rate of say 200 action potentials per second or 200 Hertz. This increase in the rate of action potentials increases the force that can be produced by this motor unit more specifically, the muscle fibers of the motor unit. Now we will discuss this in a bit more detail as we progress along. But for now, let's go back and discuss motor unit recruitment a little bit further. So here's the question. Is there a specific manner in which the different types of motor units are recruited? The simple answer is yes. The more complex question is how? So remember, there are generally three types of motor units, type 1, 2A, and 2X. These motor units have different force generating capacities, or in simpler terms, they are different in strength. The type 1s produce the least force, and the type 2Xs produce the most, and the type 2A is just right in the middle. Now these types of motor units are recruited in a particular order in response to increasing force demands, and this is described by the Henneman size principle. So let's take a look at this illustration right here. As you can see on the left, you have your motor unit types 1, 2A, and 2X. As I said earlier, type 1s are the weakest, type 2Xs are the strongest, and type 2As are just kind of in the middle. And in any muscle, there is a mixture of all three types within the motor unit pool of that muscle. 
you can also see that the sizes of each of these motor unit types differ. The type 1s are not only the weakest, but they are also the smallest. The 2As are medium, and the 2Xs, which again are the strongest, are also the largest motor units. So let's take this example of a subject performing a back squat. You can see here he is squatting against a relatively low load. Let's just say this is like 10% of his max. In his quadriceps, which are the primary muscles involved, the type 1 motor units are recruited. The CNS will always recruit the weakest motor units first, the type 1s. The type 1s that are recruited and activated produce enough force to lift this load during the back squat exercise. Then in the next set, the subject increases the load on the barbell, as you see here, and thus the force demand or resistance has increased, meaning the quadricep muscles now need to produce more force. So as we know generally, the CNS will recruit more motor units within those quadriceps muscles. Now the CNS will recruit more type 1s, but it makes the quote unquote decision to now recruit some type 2 A's, which again are slightly stronger motor units than type 1s. So the CNS, instead of just recruiting a whole bunch of weaker type 1s, it will start recruiting type 2 A's in addition to the type 1s. This is the nervous system's way of being more efficient. Yes, the CNS can recruit enough type 1s to contract against this heavier load, but it would have to recruit a lot of type 1 motor units to do so because type 1s are weaker motor units. So instead, the CNS quote unquote decides, hey, instead of recruiting tons of type 1 motor units, let's instead recruit some stronger type 2A motor units in addition. To put it into simpler terms, think of it this way. Think of it as the force produced from say 10 type 2As is equivalent to that produced by 30 type 1s. These are not accurate numbers, it's just made up numbers to provide an example. So as you can see, recruiting the type 2As in this scenario would be much more efficient route than recruiting just a bunch of type 1s. Now one thing you should notice here is that when the force demands go up, the CNS does not shut off the type 1s and just recruits type 2As. It recruits type 2As in addition to type 1s. So as the CNS recognizes the increased force demand, it recruits the type 1s that makes the decision to start recruiting the stronger type 2 A's instead of continually recruiting more type 1s. So with that said, you must know that no matter how heavy you are lifting, no matter how much the force demand, type 1s are always active. So if I ask the question, true or false, when force demands increase, type 1 motor units are deactivated and type 2s are recruited. This is false. A true statement would be, when force demands increase, type 1 and type 2A motor units are recruited. Now the subject is now increasing the load on the barbell to say 95% of his max. The force demand has now increased almost to the force generating capacity of the quadricep muscles. Now we know that the CNS is going to recruit even more motor units within the motor unit pools of the quadricep muscles. Now we also know that the type 1s will be recruited. In addition, type 2s will be recruited. But now instead of the CNS continually recruiting more of the weaker motor units, it will now tap into the strongest motor units, the type 2 Xs. So again, it's all about efficiency. So instead of recruiting tons of weaker motor units like the type 1s and 2As, the CNS will instead recruit the strongest motor units. As you can see here, the type 2Xs are recruited on top of the type 1s and 2As, and they are the last to be recruited. They are only recruited when the force demand is near the maximum force generating capacity of the muscle. So it is safe to say that when you are lifting near your max type 1s, 2As and 2Xs are all being recruited. This does not mean every single motor unit in the motor unit pool is being activated. It just means that all the motor unit types are being activated. Now, as you train and stress the muscle over time, you know that your max strength will increase. You get stronger. In our third lecture series, we will discuss how motor unit recruitment becomes quote unquote enhanced as you train over time. 
we will answer the questions of can your CNS learn to recruit type twos faster? And can you recruit more motor units overall in the motor unit pool? More on this later in the semester, so stay tuned. Now this figure is just a summary of what we discussed and it's just another visual demonstrating the relationship between motor unit type recruitment and force demand. It's another illustration of the Henneman size principles. So on the X axis, you see force demand from 0% to 100% max capacity. As you go from the lowest to the highest force demand, your CNS will recruit larger and stronger motor units in a cumulative fashion. Meaning again, it's not that all your type ones will completely deactivate, it's just the type two A's will be recruited on top of the type ones and the type two X's will be recruited on top of both the type two A's and the type ones. So if motor unit types did not exist, imagine just having one type of motor unit like the type ones. So in this figure, you see at 100% max capacity, the total number of motor units recruited is eight. Three type ones, three type two A's, and two type two X's. Again, these are not exact numbers, it's just for illustration purposes. Say we only had one type of motor unit, say we only had type ones. Because they are relatively weak at 100% max, you would have to recruit, for example, 30 type ones to produce the same force as these eight motor units of mixed types. Again, the numbers are just for illustration purposes, but the whole point is that the reason why we have more motor unit types and the reason why we recruit them in this particular order is simply for efficiency. And this figure here is just another illustration of the Henneman size principle. Again, as force demand, or in this case, effort, increases from light to maximum, the type twos, also known as fast twitch, are recruited in addition to the type ones, or slow twitch. So I think by now you all get the point with all these different examples. So let's go ahead and move on. So now that we've discussed motor unit recruitment in a bit of detail, let's now discuss a little further regarding the other mechanism of force gradation, which involves the firing rate of action potentials, or in other words, frequency. I mentioned earlier that every muscle action we produce, whether we are exercising or just walking around or talking, the contractions produced by the active motor units are a result of multiple action potentials that are generated and propagated at a certain rate. To help illustrate this, let's look down here at this figure and look at just one single motor unit. The S here stands for stimulus, which represents a single action potential. On the Y axis, you have relative tension. To simplify it, just think of this as force production. Now let's take a look at the far left. When a motor unit receives and propagates one single action potential, the fibers of that motor unit produce what we call a twitch contraction. This type of contraction is a very temporary pulsatile-like contraction as you see here. The force production climbs up, it peaks, and then drops immediately. Imagine your quads are hooked up to an electrical stim machine, something that you might find at your athletic trainer's office or your PT clinic. And that stim machine is set to transmit one single electrical impulse, which is basically an artificial action potential. How does your muscle react? Does it produce a sustained contraction? Does a contraction produce enough force to extend the leg? No to both questions, right? your quads just literally twitch. Hence, this type of contraction being referred to as a twitch contraction. That single impulse transmitted by the stim machine represents one single action potential, as I mentioned earlier. And all the motor units that receive that single action potential produces a twitch contraction. It is a brief production of force followed by a relaxation of the muscle and muscle fibers. Okay, so now what if the single motor unit receives two consecutive action potentials and the second one comes in before the twitch contraction from the first action potential returns to rest? You can see here that we have the second twitch contraction from the second action potential occurring before the first twitch contraction from the first action potential reaches rest. So you can see that the total force produced by this motor unit climbs up a bit. This type of contraction is called a 
wave summation. The wave is describing the force production wave, as you see depicted here, and summation is the addition of more force by having a second action potential come in before the twitch from the first one returns to rest. So going back to the electrical stim machine example, imagine the athletic trainer cranks up the machine just a bit and you have impulses that are transmitted at a bit of a higher rate. You will notice your quads are contracting still in a pulsatile fashion, but with slightly more force. Okay, now let's go on to this third type of contraction. Now here, as you can see by these S markers, that action potentials are generated and propagated in this motor unit at a higher rate than before, meaning there is a higher frequency of action potentials, more action potentials per second, in other words. With each successive action potential, you have twitches that do not return to rest completely because the action potentials are coming in at a higher rate. So we have even more summation going on and thus more total force production from the motor unit. And this increased rate of action potentials as shown here produces a contraction called an unfused tetanus. Now going back to the electrical stim machine example, the athletic trainer now cranks it up even more so that there are more frequent electrical impulses from the machine. Now you will notice the muscle is rapidly pulsing and the overall contractions are more forceful. But keep in mind, the contractions are still pulsatile. It's almost like a bunch of twitches repeated one after another in a highly frequent rate. But overall, the force that is produced is higher. Now we get to the fourth type of contraction. And this type of contraction is what is involved in everyday muscle actions, like when you exercise, or move your arm up and down, or simply just get up out of your seat. Now, this type of contraction allows for smooth muscle actions and not jerky, pulsatile ones. In this type of contraction, this motor unit, as you can see here, receives very, very frequent action potentials at a very high rate. So a lot of action potentials per second, in other words. Now, because each of the action potentials are coming in at a super high rate, the individual twitches in response to each action potential start to all fuse together. So that is why you don't see a wave anymore. You sort of just see the straight line. And this is again because the twitches are so frequent now. You can see that the force production climbs up until the motor unit reaches maximum tension or maximum force production. Again, this is a result of rapid action potentials being generated and propagated down the motor unit. This fusion of all the individual twitches is referred to as a fused tetanus contraction. So again, make sure you understand that the everyday muscle action is a result of motor units undergoing fused tetanus. In real life, the only way to produce a twitch, wave summation, or unfused tetanus is by using an electrical stim machine, just like the ones you would find in an athletic trainer's room or a PT clinic. So anytime you lift your arm, you talk, even when you breathe, all those muscle contractions are a fused tetanus contraction. So if I ask on the test, when you perform a bicep curl, which of the following describes the type of muscle contraction involved? It would be a fused tetanus contraction. However many motor units that are involved in that bicep curl, they are undergoing fused tetanus. So just to go back to the electrical stim machine example that I've been using, the athletic trainer now cranks it up to maximum and the machine transmits very frequent impulses to the quadricep muscles. At this point, you don't feel the quads contracting in a pulsatile manner. You don't actually feel the twitch contractions anymore. It is more of a smooth contraction and the knee extends a bit. This is just like how it would feel if you wanted to extend your knee by contracting your quads. So the question is, what is the frequency that is required to produce these fused tetanus contractions? In other words, is there a specific firing rate or action potentials per second needed to produce this fused tetanus contraction for the motor unit to reach maximum force production? For type one motor units, the frequency or firing rate or action potentials per second to reach a fused tetanus 
is between 70 to 125 hertz or 70 to 125 action potentials per second. And for type two motor units, it is between 126 to 250 hertz or 126 to 250 action potentials per second. So you can see that the type twos require a greater frequency to reach fuse tetanus than the type ones. And that is simply because type twos has greater force production than type one. So for any muscle action you produce, no matter how many motor units are recruited for that action, the active motor units receive and propagate at a minimum of 70 action potentials per second. So why is there a range here for each type of motor unit? Why is it that for say type one, the frequency ranges between 70 to 125? And why is it that for type two, it's 126 to 250 Hertz? Well, this is where force gradation is partly explained. As I said before, when the force demands go up, say like when you curl 10 pounds, then 20 pounds in the following set, there's not only an increase in motor unit recruitment as we discussed before, but the recruited motor units receive action potentials at a slightly higher rate. So for type one motor units, the frequency of action potentials can go up from 70 Hertz when curling 10 pounds to say about 100 Hertz when curling to 20 pounds. With this increase in action potential frequency, there is slightly more force produced by the motor units, in this case, the type ones. Now say you are curling 50 pounds near your max. Not only is the central nervous system going to recruit type ones, but also going to start recruiting the type twos. In addition to that, the type ones and type twos are going to receive and propagate action potentials at a higher rate. The frequency is going to increase for the motor units. For type ones, it's likely going to be at the end range of 125 Hertz. And for type twos, the frequency of action potentials can increase from 126 to, for example, 250 Hertz when lifting that 50 pound dumbbell. Now, just for some terminology, as indicated here in the second bullet, this increase in action potential frequency is referred not only as an increase in firing rate, but also rate coding this entire mechanism of action potential frequency adjusting in accordance to force demand is called rate coding. So here are some example test questions related to rate coding. Number one, during a typical muscle action such as that involved in simply lifting the arm, which of the following contractions are produced by the active motor units? A, twitch. B, wave summation. C, unfused tetanus or D, fused tetanus? The answer here would be D, fused tetanus. In real life, again, the only way to produce a twitch, wave summation, or unfused tetanus is by using an electrical stim machine, just like the ones you would find at an athletic trainer's room or a PT clinic, for example. So question number two, in relation to rate coding, when force demands increase, which of the following best describes the changes in frequency in type one motor units? The answer to this question would be increased frequency from 70 Hertz up to 125 Hertz. You do not want to choose any answer choices that say a decrease in frequency or a frequency range between 126 and 250 since that's for type two motor units. Question number three, in relation to rate coding, when force demands increase towards maximum capacity and type two motor units are recruited, which of the following best describes changes in frequency in type two motor units? The answer would be increased frequency from 126 up to 250 Hertz, or again, action potentials per second. Question number four, true or false? The maximum force that can be produced by a given motor unit is achieved during a wave summation contraction. The answer would be false. The maximum force that can be produced by a given motor unit is achieved only during a fused tetanus contraction. 
Okay, so in summary, the two ways that muscles can produce increasing force with increasing demand or resistance, in other words, are one, recruitment of motor units in the order of type 1 to type 2A to type 2X in a cumulative fashion, and two, the motor units that are active or recruited receive and propagate an increased rate of action potentials. In other words, there's increased firing rate of motor units involved. This is referred to, again, as rate coding. As you can see, recruitment and rate coding work together so the body can adjust muscular force production as needed. Later again, in our third lecture series, we will discuss how we get stronger through adaptations in both recruitment and rate coding. Now I decided for this online course to skip slide 42 as shown here, since the information in this section really relies heavily on demonstrations, which would be difficult to do in a virtual format. In a normal classroom setting, this is where I would have a volunteer come up to help demonstrate the concepts presented here in slide 42. So for this online course, we will omit this slide and information on this slide will not be presented on the exam. So this information is related to number 16 on your study outline. So you may skip number 16. Okay, so now here we have a couple more sample true and false exam questions. It is a bit on the easier side, but it's just again to help you recap what we recently learned. Number one, the size principle states that when a motor unit is fired, all fibers of that motor unit contract maximally. This is false. Now the reason I put this sample question here is to remind you all to read the questions carefully. Some may have selected true. What is described here is not the size principle, it is the all or none principle. Remember the Henneman size principle just describes the order in which motor unit types are recruited in response to increasing force demands. Number two, motor unit recruitment refers to the number of motor units stimulated for a given muscle action. This is true. We recruit more motor units to help out with the muscle action if more force is needed. Okay, let's now move on to some other important topics related to the neuromuscular system. So far, we've discussed the motor neurons and the signals that start from the central nervous system and propagate towards the muscle. As we mentioned earlier, this is referred to as efferent signals, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. And motor neurons are efferent neurons or nerve fibers because they only carry signals from the central nervous system to the muscle. The question now is, do nerve signals go the other way from the muscle to the central nervous system? In other words, afferent signals, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. The answer to that is a yes. Afferent is synonymous with the term sensory. So afferent signals are sensory signals that go from the peripheral tissues, like the muscle, to the central nervous system, ultimately ending in the brain where the sensation is realized. So afferent is sensory, while efferent is motor. Now many of you going into the health and medical fields, especially physical and occupational therapy, may think in order to restore movement and function, the main focus is the efferent motor system, because that is what is responsible for muscle contractions. But you will find that as you go through graduate school and into your profession that the sensory or afferent system is just as important. Skeletal muscle is one of the largest and most important sensory organs within the human body. Muscle is constantly communicating with the central nervous system through afferent signals meaning muscle is constantly generating and propagating action potentials through specialized nerve fibers or neurons towards the central nervous system to provide sensory information. These neurons are called sensory neurons, or simply afferents for short, since they only transmit afferent signals. So now what type of sensory information is provided by the muscle? Primarily, it is spatial awareness, meaning the body's position in space. 
It provides sensory information to the central nervous system about whether the arm is extended or flexed, for example, or if you are sitting or standing. Without this sensory system in place, we would not know how our body is positioned. For example, if I closed my eyes and someone positioned my legs extended out, Without this sensory information, I would not know that my legs were extended out. It's a very trippy thing to comprehend. In complete spinal cord injury patients, not only is the motor nerve severed, preventing muscle contraction, but also sensory nerves are also severed and thus they have difficulty knowing how the limbs are positioned. They don't receive that information from the muscle since the connection has been disrupted. So what is this sensation of body positioning referred to as? It is referred to as proprioception, and thus the specific sensory nerve fibers or neurons that are responsible for proprioception are called proprioceptors. So what are the main proprioceptors? These are referred to as group 1A, and group two sensory neurons, and they innervate the muscle deep inside the belly of the muscle where you have special muscle fibers called intrafusal fibers. This is shown here in this figure. These intrafusal fibers are deep inside the muscle belly. Now, keep in mind that intrafusal fibers are not the muscle fibers that we were discussing when we were talking about EC coupling and movement. They are not the ones innervated by the alpha motor neurons. The fibers that contract and contribute to muscle actions are called extrafusal fibers, and they are shown here. And as you can see, the extrafusal fibers are innervated by the alpha motor neuron. Again, the intrafusal fibers are deep fibers that are roughly in the center of the muscle, and the extrafusal fibers are a little bit more superficial and are described as motor and the intrafusal fibers are sensory. So in summary, this means that the extrafusal fibers are directly involved in muscle contractions and movement, while the intrafusal fibers are directly involved in sensory processes, more specifically proprioception. Now, as you can see in this figure, the intrafusal fibers are innervated mainly by the sensory neurons. The group 1A is shown here spiraled around the intrafusal fibers and also you have the group twos here that innervate the intrafusal fibers as well. Again, these are your sensory neurons, specifically the proprioceptors. This entire system here that includes the sensory neurons and the intrafusal fibers is referred to as the muscle spindles. So altogether, this is your muscle spindle. The alpha motor neuron and the extrafusal fibers are not part of the muscle spindles. Okay, so what stimulates or excites the group 1A and 2 sensory neurons? In other words, what do these sensory neurons detect? They are stimulated by the change in the length of the intrafusal fibers and thus the muscle, particularly stretch or lengthening of the muscle. So when the muscle lengthens or stretches, the intrafusal fibers also lengthen or stretches. So when your muscle changes lengths, like when you contract or stretch, these intrafusal fibers also change in length, and this is detected by tiny receptors at the ends of the group 1As and 2s called stretch receptors. Now, in response to a stretch, the group 1As and 2s depolarize and action potentials are generated. These action potentials then propagate in the afferent direction towards the central nervous system. These signals eventually reach the brain. The brain processes information on the length and the change of length of the muscle, thereby providing information on body positioning and the change in body positioning. This is again called proprioception. So to put this into a practical example, imagine sitting down with the feet on the floor. When you kick your legs out, you are now lengthening or stretching the hamstrings. The intrafusal fibers of the hamstrings are therefore also lengthening or stretching. The group 1As and 2 sensory neurons that innervate 
these intrafusal fibers are now activated in response to this stretch of the hamstring muscles and the intrafusal fibers of the hamstring muscles. They depolarize and produce action potentials which propagate in the afferent direction to the central nervous system. The central nervous system eventually processes these signals which result in information regarding the length and change of length of your hamstrings thus providing information on the fact that your leg is extended out. Because of this sensory mechanism, you know that your legs are extended out. Okay, here are some further details that are indicated on this slide. First, the intrafusal fibers are separated into two general types of fibers. One is the nuclear bag fibers, and that is the more balloon-like fiber shown here in this figure. The other is the nuclear chain fibers that look like sticks as shown here. The nuclear back fibers are mainly innervated by group 1A afferents. These nuclear back fibers and thus group 1A afferents detect mainly the rate of length change or simply the rate of stretch. So how fast the muscle stretches or the speed of stretch. The nuclear chain fibers, on the other hand, are mainly innervated by group 2 afferents. The nuclear chain fibers are responsible for sensing a change in length or stretch, not necessarily the speed of stretch. So group 1A afferents detect the rate or speed of stretch, and the group 2s detect change in length or stretch. Now another important piece of information is that the group 2s are not only proprioceptors, but are also what we call nociceptors, N-O-C-I-C-E-P-T-O-R-S. Nociception is the process by the sensory nervous system of encoding pain stimuli or noxious stimuli, N-O-X-I-O-U-S. So pain and noxious go hand in hand. So nociceptors are sensory neurons like the group 2 afferents that detect pain or noxious stimuli. These noxious stimuli come in a variety of forms which include thermal, chemical, or mechanical. The group 2 afferents detect mechanical changes in the muscle such as stretch as we discussed before. But when the mechanical or stretch stimuli goes beyond a certain threshold, that mechanical stimuli can become a noxious or pain stimuli. In other words, when the stretch or lengthening of the muscle reaches a certain level or goes quote unquote too far, the group twos can induce nociception, which again is simply the sensation of pain. So the next time you do a hamstring stretch and you feel the pain at the end of your range of motion, think to yourself that the stretch of the intrafusal fibers has gone to a point where the stretch stimuli is now a pain or noxious stimuli, which is in turn detected by the group 2 afferents, which then carry that nociception signal to the central nervous system, which then is processed and pain is realized. This is the point where you usually stop stretching the hamstring further. So why do I talk about pain in this context? Why do you think we have a sensation of pain when we stretch our muscles to a certain point? Why do you think the human body has this mechanism in place where sensory neurons detect this stretch and turns that stimuli into a pain stimuli when that stretch reaches a certain threshold? Think of this from a biological perspective. The human body is very sophisticated in that it has the ability to protect itself from threats. So what is pain in this regard? Pain is a protective mechanism. It is to prevent you from doing whatever it is that causes the pain because whatever you're doing can cause harm to tissues or to the human body in general. For example, when you accidentally touch a hot stove, you feel immediate pain. These result from sensory neurons at the skin detecting the temperature and the thermal stimuli reaching a level that becomes noxious or pain inducing. This causes the sensation of pain which is undesirable so your reaction would be to remove your hand from the stove. This entire process is there to protect the human body from the heat of the stove that can cause damage to the tissues. 
In the same way, the muscle spindles, which include the intrafusal fibers and the sensory neurons, are not only there to give you the sensation of body positioning or proprioception, but is also there to protect, particularly the muscle. When the muscle stretches to a certain point, the stretch stimuli, much like the thermal stimuli in the prior example, turns into a noxious or pain stimuli. This causes a sensation of pain, so your reaction is to stop stretching the muscle further and to then relax. This is because the stretch of the muscle at that certain point can cause damage to the tissue. The muscle recognizes this as a threat to the muscle. The pain sensation when you stretch at the end of your range of motion is to protect you from damaging your muscles by deterring you from stretching the muscle further. Now here is a very simplistic view of the muscle spindles. Here we have deep inside the muscle, the intrafusal fibers and the sensory neurons that innervate it. You can see here that this is the group 1A afferents that spiral around the nuclear bag intrafusal fibers. Again, the muscle spindles are mainly for the purpose of proprioception by detecting not only the change in muscle length or stretch, but also the speed of stretch. I also emphasize that the muscle spindles, particularly the group 2 afferents, are also responsible for nociception or pain when the change of length reaches a certain threshold that can be a threat to the muscle. Again, this stretch stimulus is at this point a noxious stimulus and this is for the protection of the muscle from damage due to quote unquote overstretching the muscle. So the next question is, are the group 1A afferents also protective of the muscle? Meaning, do they also detect the threat to the muscle and provide signals of this threat to the central nervous system? The answer to that is yes, and this protective mechanism is afforded through what we call reflexive contractions. So group 1As are not protecting the muscle through nociception, it is protecting it through a feedback loop, which we'll discuss in the next slide. The myotactic or stretch reflex mechanism is an involuntary contraction of a muscle that undergoes a very rapid stretch. Remember as we discussed before, the group 2 afferents detect a change in length while the group 1A mainly detects the rate or speed of stretch. So with more rapid change in length or stretch, the more stimulation of the group 1As. Now when the speed of stretch reaches a certain threshold, the stimuli that the group 1A afferents detect can result in a contraction and therefore shortening of the muscle that is being stretched. This is called a reflexive contraction, referred to again as the myotactic reflex. So fundamentally, why do we have this reflexive contraction in response to a very rapid stretch? Again, just like pain, it is for the protection of the muscle. So when the muscle is stretched rapidly, the group 1A detects this very high rate of stretch and sees this as a threat. So the afferent signals carried to the central nervous system in turn results in a reflexive shortening contraction of the previously stretched muscle, forcing it out of a stretch. This is again a protective mechanism. So let's discuss this mechanism in much more detail. How does it work, in other words? To test the myotactic reflex mechanism, we use a classic procedure called the patellar reflex test, or the knee-jerk test, and this is shown here on the right side. This is a basic test to examine the efficiency of your sensory and motor system, the afferent and efferent system, respectively. In this test, as you can see on the right side here in this figure, the subject will sit with the lower leg hanging and relaxed. The tester would take a hammer and tap the lower end of the patellar tendon. Now most of you know that the patellar tendon attaches the quadriceps to the patella or the kneecap and the tibia, which is the large bone of the lower leg. When the hammer taps, the patellar tendon, it pushes the tendon in and it sort of yanks on the quadriceps muscle. In other words, it rapidly stretches the quadriceps muscle. This rapid stretch of the quadriceps also produces a rapid stretch of the intrafusal fibers of the quadriceps muscle spindles. 
As we said before, the group 1A detects this rapid stretch, and because the stretch is very fast, the stimuli is pretty high. So you can imagine the group 1A is highly stimulated and sending a lot of signals in the afferent direction towards the central nervous system, as you see here as a green nerve fiber or neuron. Now let's focus right here in the central nervous system, particularly the spinal cord. Here there are connections or innervations between the group 1A afferents or nerve fibers, this green guy here, and an alpha motor neuron, which is represented by this red neuron. When the stretch stimuli is high at the muscle spindles, the signals from the group 1A afferents can in turn depolarize and activate the alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord. These alpha motor neurons innervate the muscles that are being stretched. In this example, it would be the quadriceps. The alpha motor neuron then propagates efferent signals to the quadriceps and causes a contraction of the extrafusal muscle fibers via EC coupling, which we discussed in the beginning part of this lecture series. This then causes the quadricep muscles to shorten and contract, and this would result in a little knee extension or a kick, as you see here. The knee extension was a result of an involuntary reflexive contraction. As you can see, this reflexive shortening contraction of the quadriceps is to counteract the stretch, or rather the rapid stretch of the muscle caused by the yanking of the patellar tendon due to the hammer tapping it. The speed of the stretch was deemed a threat by the muscle spindles, particularly the group 1A afferents. The stimuli produced a signal sufficient enough to stimulate the alpha motor neurons of the quadriceps here at the spinal cord, causing a shortening contraction of the quadriceps muscles and thereby countering the stretch. Now this mechanism is more active throughout the day than you may think. Let's think of an example now of when the stretch reflex would be active to protect the muscle from overstretching. Think about kicking a soccer ball as far as possible. When you kick a ball in this manner, you have to forcefully extend your knee and flex your hips. This action produces a rapid stretch of the hamstring muscles. When kicking the ball and swinging your leg through the ball, the rapid stretch of the hamstrings and its intrafusal fibers would highly stimulate the group 1A afferents. This will result in a large afferent signal transmitted by the group 1A neurons to the central nervous system. These signals at the spinal cord would in turn activate alpha motor neurons of the hamstrings sending efferent signals back to the hamstrings to contract it to shorten it so that it does not stretch to the point of damage. So next time you kick a ball, think about this myotactic stretch reflex mechanism. Okay, to summarize the myotactic reflex again, when you take a hammer to the patellar tendon, it will yank on the quadricep, rapidly stretching the quadricep muscles. Now the interfusal fibers of the muscle spindles within the quadriceps would stretch rapidly as well. This will activate or highly depolarize the group 1A afferents, which would propagate the signal in the afferent direction towards the spinal cord. Here, those signals will in turn depolarize the alpha motor neuron, which will send efferent signals back to the quadriceps, contracting it and shortening it, taking it out of the stretch. And this is why during this test, you have a little knee extension going on. This was a reflexive contraction. Okay, now other than for the purpose of protection, the question is, can this stretch reflex mechanism have other purposes? Can it be manipulated for other purposes? So the next question I want to present is this, can this reflexive contraction be manipulated in a way that can be used to enhance a voluntary contraction? And if so, how can we use it this way? The answer to this question is yes. The reflexive contraction caused by a rapid stretch of a muscle can be used to enhance the voluntary contraction of that muscle. So how does this work? This works through what we call the stretch shortening cycle. 
and it is highly implicated in sport performance especially. To understand the stretch shortening cycle, let's use this long jump example as shown in this figure. Specifically, let's focus on the highlighted area right here where the foot lands and subsequently propels the body forward. This point here can be compartmentalized into three specific phases, which are the three phases of the stretch shortening cycle. So first we have the landing phase, which is referred to as the eccentric phase of the stretch shortening cycle. This is when the athlete lands on one of their feet with a lot of downward force or momentum. Now, if you imagine yourself running full speed and then landing on the lead foot, you can imagine that as you land and as you stop yourself from falling to the floor, there is going to be a very rapid stretch of the quadricep muscles, which in this case are what we call the agonist muscles or the prime movers. These are the muscles that's going to propel the body forward. So during the eccentric slash landing phase, the quadriceps, the agonist muscles, undergo a very rapid stretch and thus the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindles of the quadriceps muscles also undergo a very rapid stretch. As we discuss, this rapid stretch of the muscle spindles slash intrafusal fibers will stimulate the group 1A sensory neurons generating action potentials. Now after the landing, there is a brief pause before the takeoff. And this pause is referred to as the amortization phase. During this phase, there is really no movement. It's a pause. Physiologically, however, during this pause, the action potentials propagate via the group 1A neurons in the afferent direction towards the CNS. At the CNS, specifically the spinal cord, the 1A afferent signals excite the alpha motor neurons and efferent action potentials propagate back towards the quadricep muscles, more particularly the extra fusal fibers of the quadriceps. After this, we have the takeoff or the concentric phase where you have an explosive contraction of the agonist muscles, the quadriceps. You have a high force, high powered contraction. This occurs because the efferent signals, those action potentials returning back to the quadriceps muscles produce a reflexive contraction, which occurs in addition to voluntary non-reflexive contractions of the quadriceps. In other words, the reflexive contractions of the quads as a result of the prior rapid stretch during the landing phase or the eccentric phase enhances the overall contraction of the quadriceps muscles. Therefore, the quadriceps contract with very high force and power, which allows the athlete to explode out of the landing and propel the body as far as possible. Now, as another example of movements that involve the stretch shortening cycle and the myotactic reflex for enhanced contractions is the counter movement vertical jump. So just imagine doing a vertical jump test and you're asked to mm -hmm. jump as high as you possibly can. Now you're set and ready to perform the vertical jump. What would be your initial move? If you really think about it carefully, you would start by doing a quick squat down. You would do this almost naturally without much thought. It's an innate action when you want to perform an explosive jump. We never start a maximal vertical jump by slowly lowering our body and then trying to explosively jump up. It always is a rapid drop first. This initial movement is called the counter movement. And this counter movement is intended to stimulate the muscle spindles and the group 1A afferents. So in a vertical jump scenario, the counter movement is the eccentric phase of the stretch shortening cycle. When you rapidly drop your lower body and stop yourself from dropping to the floor, the agonist muscle, which in this case would again be the quadriceps muscles, would undergo a rapid stretch. So as we discussed earlier, as the muscle rapidly stretches, the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindles would also rapidly stretch. This would in turn stimulate the group 1A sensory neurons generating action potentials propagating the afferent direction. Then you would have the pause between the end of the counter movement 
and right before the vertical jump. This is again referred to as the amortization phase. During this pause phase, the action potentials are in the middle of propagating in the afferent direction towards the CNS and at the spinal cord, the group 1A afferents would excite the alpha motor neurons, relaying back action potentials towards the quadriceps. Now when those action potentials reach the quadriceps muscles, they will undergo a reflexive contraction in addition to the voluntary contractions, overall producing a very high force, high powered muscle contraction, which allows the body to propel upwards with a lot of force. This is all occurring in the concentric phase. Now for the sake of this course, you do not need to pay attention to any of the figures in this middle row. Just focus on the top and the bottom. Now another example of the stretch shortening cycle is during resistance exercise. Let's take an exercise like the seated shoulder dumbbell press. Now imagine doing that exercise. First, you would get the dumbbells into position resting in front of your shoulders. Then imagine doing your first repetition. Imagine starting at the very bottom and just trying to push it up. Then you return it back down and then do the second repetition. Now think to yourself, if you ever done the, the seated shoulder press, was the first rep easier or was the second rep easier? Most of you might say that the second rep would be easier than the first rep. Why would that be the case? Well, let's think about it. In this exercise, the first rep started from the very bottom and then you just pushed up, meaning there was only a concentric phase of this first rep. In the second rep, there was the eccentric phase. You brought the weight back down, then you went back up. So in the second rep, that repetition involved the myotactic reflex. That involved the stretch shortening cycle. There was reflexive contractions in addition to voluntary contractions. And therefore, it felt like in the second rep, there was much more force and much more efficiency lifting the weight up. Now in the slide, you will see a link to a slow motion video of a counter movement vertical jump. Now I want you to watch it and identify the three phases of the stretch shortening cycle and describe what is happening physiologically during each phase. Let's go ahead and watch it. Now first, you know you will have the counter movement. This is the eccentric phase. And the reason why this subject is doing the counter movement is to induce a rapid stretch of the agonist muscle, which in this case would be the muscles of the quadriceps. Now during the counter movement, the eccentric phase, the quadriceps are undergoing a rapid stretch. And thus, the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindles of the quadriceps are also undergoing a rapid stretch, highly stimulating them, and thus highly stimulating the group 1A afferents. This depolarizes the group 1A afferents, sending action potentials in the afferent direction to the central nervous system. Now at the end of the counter movement, you'll have a small pause before the takeoff. This is the amortization phase. This is where the signals are going towards the spinal cord and relaying back to the quadriceps via the alpha motor neurons. Now, once those signals have reached the quadriceps, the reflexive contractions caused by the initial rapid stretch plus the voluntary signals that cause the voluntary contractions would together form a very high force contraction leading into the concentric phase where the vertical jump would happen. So again, that counter movement is almost done naturally when you want to produce an explosive movement. It's a innate movement that we do so that we can utilize the stretch shortening cycle to produce a high force contraction as such. So as you might have realized by now, the stretch shortening cycle and the myotactic reflex mechanism is highly implicated in many sports specific movements such as the crossover or change of direction, or getting off the line like this wide receiver right here. If you look at each of these movements, you will notice the three phases of the stretch shortening cycle. When you do a change of movement, such as a running back would when cutting, one foot lands and plants. This is the eccentric phase, where the agonist muscle along with the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindles rapidly stretch, stimulating the group 1A afferents. 
Before the change of direction, there is an amortization phase in which the signals are reeling back towards the muscle. And then you have the change of direction in the concentric phase, where reflexive and voluntary contractions combine to produce a high force movement. Now, in many sports, the most effective players are the ones who can produce these movements the fastest. And what allows athletes to be more explosive during these movements is the efficiency of the stretch shortening cycle, meaning the three phases occur quickly. Now that you know what happens physiologically in those three phases, you would know what processes need to occur quickly to perform these movements quicker, to be more explosive in simpler terms. In the eccentric phase, the muscle spindles must be more sensitive to rapid stretch, thus stimulating the group 1As more efficiently. In the amortization phase, the afferent and efferent signals need to propagate faster. In the concentric phase, there needs to be a lot of muscle activation to produce large amounts of force and velocity, or power in other words. So with that said, how can we improve the stretch shortening cycle to be more explosive, to complete stretch shortening movements much more efficiently, just like these athletes you see here? Well, like anything in performance, training would be needed to improve stretch shortening movements and become more explosive. So there are specific exercises intended to stress the stretch shortening cycle to eventually make it more efficient or quicker, in other words. One way to train the stretch shortening cycle is to load the stretch shortening cycle. For example, here we have the depth jump, where one would step off from an elevated height, and when they land, their goal is to spend as little time on the floor as possible and to jump up as high as possible. By stepping off from an elevation, this puts more stress on the eccentric phase upon landing. This produces much more stretch of the agonist muscles and the muscle spindles. Over time, this will cause the muscle to adapt in a way that makes the muscle spindles more sensitive to stretch, thus inducing the reflex of contraction much more effectively. The same concept applies to these types of exercises, often referred to as power-centric exercises. These are very similar to Olympic lifting. This one is called the hang clean. If you look at the movements of the hang clean in the lower body, you will see that it is the same as the vertical jump. You first have a quick counter movement, as you just saw there, that is loaded by the weights on the barbell. The goal here is to then explode out of the counter movement upwards with enough force to propel the weight up, eventually catching it right in front of your body. You can see the hang clean is essentially a loaded counter movement jump. This type of training is stretch shortening training. You are loading the stretch shortening cycle through these particular exercises. And there's a whole variety of these types of exercises that stress the stretch shortening cycle. A lot of them are referred to as plyometrics, which a lot of you have heard of before. So what is the mechanism underlying this improvement in stretch shortening movements or explosiveness in response to training? Well, to explain this, we need to look at the muscle spindles again, which include the intrafusal fibers and the neurons that innervate it. Here we have the intrafusal fibers again, with the group 1A innervating it by spiraling around the nuclear bag fibers. Now, I mentioned earlier that for the most part, the intrafusal fibers do not have the ability to contract. They do not contribute directly to the actual contraction of a muscle. They are just sensory fibers that respond to stretch. But at the very ends of the intrafusal fibers, as you see here, you have myofilaments that can cause the ends of the intrafusal fibers to contract, only the ends. Now, just like the extrafusal fibers, the contractile ends of the intrafusal fibers need an electrical signal, action potentials, to contract. This is afforded through the gamma motor neurons, not the alpha motor neurons. These gamma motor neurons are motor neurons. That means they are efferent neurons that carry signals from the central nervous system to the ends of the intrafusal fibers inside the muscle. The central nervous system sends low level electrical signals through the gamma motor neurons to control the contraction of the ends of the intrafusal fibers. The reason for this is that the intrafusal fibers need to be somewhat taut in order to be responsive to a stretch. 
If there is too much slack in the intrafusal fibers, they will not be as sensitive to a stretch stimulus. They won't be as responsive to a stretch stimulus. This is typically what happens with aging or detraining. The signals from the gamma motor neurons can diminish and the ends of the intrafusal fibers are less contracted, thus making the intrafusal fibers less taut with more slack. This makes the intrafusal fibers and thus the muscle spindles less sensitive and responsive to stretch. And thus the stretch shortening cycle is also less effective. This is one reason why aging athletes are characterized by a loss of explosiveness because we know that the muscle spindles are highly implicated in stretch shortening movements. Now as a result of specific explosive type training as shown in the prior slide, you can improve the stretch shortening cycle by increasing the sensitivity of the muscle spindles. This occurs through repeated stress to the muscle spindles by training like shown in the previous slides. Stretch shortening type training or explosive training increases the activation of these gamma motor neurons, causing more contraction at the ends of the intrafusal fibers, thus making the intrafusal fibers and the overall muscle spindles more taut and more sensitive to stretch. This would in turn promote further reflexive support for high powered contractions and movements during exercise and sport. Now with all that said, we have to understand why technique is especially critical when training the stretch shortening cycle. If you use improper technique, you may be negating the whole purpose of stretch shortening training like the hand clean. What you see here is a very common scenario, especially in high school athletics. This young athlete here is attempting to do a hand clean just like the athlete shown a few slides back. But we see a very huge difference between the two athletes. The female athlete in the figure a few slides back had perfect technique in the hand clean, while this athlete here not so much. So why is technique so important besides safety concerns? Well, if you are just simply trying to swing this bar up using your arms and the movement requires no involvement of the stretch shortening cycle, then that would defeat the whole purpose of doing this type of exercise. The fundamental technique of these types of stretch shortening exercises need to include the three phases of the stretch shortening cycle. There needs to be an overloaded eccentric phase or counter movement, and there needs to be a quick amortization and forceful concentric phase. When you perform these exercises like this, you do not have those three phases, thereby again negating the whole purpose of this exercise. So always know that for these exercises, it is not about just figuring out whatever way to get the weight up, it is always about technique and using the stretch shortening cycle since that is what you are trying to improve. Now that you know the science behind it all, you have a good advanced understanding of how these types of exercises function. Now as a final sample question, which phase of the stretch shortening cycle involves stimulation of the muscle spindles? A, eccentric, B, amortization, C, concentric, D, plyometric. You can obviously cross out plyometric because this just doesn't make sense. The answer to this would be A, eccentric. But if the answer choice said counter movement instead of eccentric, that would also be correct because the counter movement is the eccentric phase. Now this question is definitely on the easier side, so just know the questions on the exam may be a little bit more detailed than this. So please make sure you address the related items on the study outline provided in detail. Now for the next two slides, please go ahead and skip them. They are also highly reliant on classroom demonstration, so it will be very difficult to explain these concepts through this video. I will, however, provide future videos on these topics just for your information. The information on slides 56 and 57 will not be present on the exam, so any items on the study outline related to the information in slide 56 and 57, you may omit those items. Now in the last slide, you will notice a link to this website right here. This is just another resource for you to help visualize the entire EC coupling process. So make sure you take a look as you study the EC coupling process. Okay, so that concludes the lecture series on neuromuscular control of human movement. Now everything we discussed far, as I said before, will be on exam one. The important topics for you to focus on are presented in the study outline. 
If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.